Uh, hello, YouTubers and fellow students of the JFK assassination. I'd like to talk to you about what is probably the most controversial issue in the JFK case. And, of course, that's the single bullet theory. After studying and writing about this crime for over 13 years, I think we might have dropped the ball on this issue. Uh, many of us have been so intent on denying that one bullet passed through both victims that we didn't ask some extremely important questions such as where did that shot actually come from. This is where the real controversy begins. But after studying these images more times than I can count, I really don't know how we can come to any other objective conclusion than that both men were hit at the same time. The shot was fired at about frame 223, causing an expulsion of blood and bone that blew open the governor's jacket and flipped his tie over and to his left. Look guys, I, I know there's more to the debate here, but I'm just going to ask you to temporarily, and for the sake of argument, set aside your preconceptions and look at this as though one bullet really did pass through both men. Okay, let's be honest folks. This illustration, which appeared in a couple of conspiracy books, is crap. The angle of the bullet trajectory is much too sharp, and it doesn't reflect the fact that Connolly was sitting about six inches further inboard uh, from Kennedy. But look at this illustration from the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Notice that like Gerald Posner and Dale Myers in later years, they had to position Governor Connolly sitting to his extreme left. That's because the angle of a bullet coming in from the alleged sniper's nest was a relatively sharp 10 degrees. But there is simply no good reason to think that the governor was only using half of his car seat that day. But if we position him realistically, we find that that 10 degree angle shrinks to about 2 degrees. Back in 97, I loaded the HSCA surveyor's diagram into a CAD program and very carefully plotted a 2 degree trajectory back from the limousine. That line intersected perfectly with a long suspected fire escape on the west side of the Daltex building. This illustration was not done with CAD precision, but it's pretty close, and it gives us a real world perspective on these trajectories. That fire escape can be easily seen in this photo taken by AP photographer James Alchins. Over the years, I've been cited at several websites stating that in the JFK case, the truth lies between the extremes. There is no better example of that than right here. The government and its defenders obviously based their analysis on a desire to connect this shot to Oswald. The hardcore conspiracy people analyze it looking for ways to prove the single bullet theory was wrong. But this is what you get if you approach this question objectively and with no axes to grind. Now let's look at the vertical angle of that shot. Uh, this is where the government's case really starts to fall apart. A shot from the alleged sniper's nest on the sixth floor of the depository would have to have come in at a very steep angle of almost 20 degrees and would have to have entered at the base of the president's neck. But the president's position was very specific about where that wound was located. He placed it at the level of the third thoracic vertebrae, far below the neckline. Later that night, and 2,000 miles away, Dr. Thornton Boswell carefully measured the wounds, placing the back wound at exactly the same place that Berkeley did. Years later, the government pressured both of those doctors to change their stories and place the wound where the Warren Commission wanted it. Uh, but come on, guys, how impressed are you by that, really? Riding on the trunk all the way to Parkland Hospital, Clint Hill had an excellent view of the president and I seriously doubt that anyone could ever pressure him into changing his story. Even the FBI in its simulation couldn't make a trajectory back to the alleged sniper's nest work. They put the entry wound in the same place everyone else did. But this is the clincher. Uh, this is the hard photographic evidence that confirms the location of the back wound. Of course, this is not the wound. It's more likely a dried clot of blood. This has to be the actual wound, because we can easily see the outline of an abrasion ring. Notice, by the way, that the holes in the clothing are located somewhat lower than the entry wound we see in the photo. 
By my calculation, this is about the level of that wound. The reason for that discrepancy is that the president's coat was bunched in the back. Uh, this is a photo taken just a few seconds before that shot was fired. Of course, it's ludicrous to think that the entry point was displaced all the way up to the neckline. But if the bullet entered where the doctors and the photos tell us it did, then the bunching we see resulted in the hole being displaced by almost three inches. Doesn't that make a lot more sense? So the real trajectory looks something like this. By the way, when the bullet exited the neck, it was tumbling, so we would not expect it to continue on a linear path. But the bottom line here is that this bullet could not have come from the sixth floor of the depository. So where did it come from? We already know that the lateral angle points at the Daltex building. Let's take another look and see if we can't zero in a bit on where that shot came from. Over the years, some theorists have suggested that a possible sniper can be seen in the second floor window of the Daltex. But there is no reason a sniper there would need to be visible. From anywhere behind that fire escape, a shooter could sit back a few feet from the window and be invisible to the rest of Dealey Plaza. More importantly, the trajectory would just be too low. As Paul Burke pointed out to me many years ago, a shot from that window at frame 223 uh, would hit the windshield of the Secret Service follow-up car before it could hit the president. But as he also pointed out to me, a shot from the third floor would align perfectly. Ladies and gentlemen, exactly one professional criminal was apprehended in Dealey Plaza that day. His name was James Braden, and he was discovered on the third floor of the Daltex building. The night before the attack, Braden stayed at the Mafia-owned Cabana Hotel, conveniently located on Stemmons Freeway less than five minutes from Dealey Plaza. By an amazing coincidence and by his own admission, a fellow named Jack Ruby was also at that hotel at exactly the same time Braden was. Ruby was also meeting there with a goon from Chicago named Lawrence Myers, whom HSC investigators discovered had gotten a phone call shortly before the assassination from a young man in New Orleans named David Ferry another long-time suspect. And researcher Anthony Summers discovered that both Ferry and Braden worked out of the same floor in the Mafia-owned Per Marquette building in New Orleans. But wait a minute, wasn't CE 399, the supposed magic bullet, proven to have come from the alleged murder weapon? Undoubtedly that bullet did, but the real question is, was that the same bullet that was found near the stretchers at Parkland Hospital? Four men handled the original bullet before it was turned over to the FBI. Hospital employee Daryl Tomlinson, his supervisor Mr. O.P. Wright, Secret Service Agent Richard Johnson, and Secret Service Agent Elmer Todd. The FBI told the Warren Commission that they all confirmed that CE-399 was the bullet they found at the hospital, but the FBI lied. In fact, the FBI's own internal documents later proved that every one of those men refused to authenticate CE-399 as the original bullet. But wait a minute, didn't Dr. Vincent Gwynn match particles found in Connolly's wrist to CE-399? Well, he found a match with the particles that the FBI had turned in, but the originals were obviously switched out for a totally different set of particles, which probably did come from CE-399. But we have no legitimate proof that those were the original particles found in the governor's wrist. The clincher here comes from John Connolly himself, who confirmed that the bullet found in the hallway could not have been the same one that fell out of his thigh. This is from his autobiography entitled, In History's Shadow. The most curious discovery of all took place when they rolled me off the stretcher and onto the examining table. A metal object fell to the floor with a click no louder than a wedding band. The nurse picked it up and slipped it into her pocket. It was the bullet from my body, the one that passed through my back, chest, and wrist and worked itself loose from my thigh. So the bullet that was found in the hallway and passed to the FBI probably had nothing to do with the assassination. But the FBI had no way of knowing that, so they switched that bullet for one that was politically correct. Well, there's a lot more to talk about, but I'm out of time. If you believe nothing else I ever tell you, believe that an open mind is the only tool you really need to unravel this case. My name is Bob Harris. Thanks for listening.